Um, but a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to join the bioethics and humanities department at the University of Washington. Um, and it's really been um, a really lovely and generative time um, because, you know, as a, as an ethnographer, um, even though one is immersed in the action, one is never supposed to forget that this action that you are a part of is not really your own because you're going to eventually leave it behind. Um, the hope, of course, is that when you do leave, you'll bring with you a critical and perhaps even insightful analysis that you hope will be of some value to the people that you study. But usually the analysis is not generally directed towards the everyday concerns of the people and places that we study. Um, but, you know, to move into bioethics for me is in some ways to accept the action of healthcare as being my own, or at least um, um, that of my very close colleagues. Um, and so for me to wade into the waters of bioethics has raised the question of whether this ethnographer can shift my position of remove to be in closer conversation with the everyday concerns of clinicians and to consider how that shift might profitably add to the interdisciplinary conversation happening in the world of bioethics. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you about one of the ways in which I've been thinking about how to answer that question um, for myself, and that is to focus on an arena uh, of both empirical and policy import, and that is the specter of burnout in the healthcare workforce. So like most specters, burnout has the quality of being both ubiquitous and elusive um, because burnout does not, in fact, have the weight of being an official diagnosis, but it has the material heft of lived experience. It has become the predominant embodied metaphor for everyone working in healthcare, from physicians to nurses, aides, and administrators. And the salience of that metaphor has also taken up residence in the minds of those of us who don't work in healthcare. I don't think I've seen any story about healthcare care in the last two years that does not somehow reference the specter of burnout. Um, so burnout, we are to understand, is everywhere, um, and it has become the explanation for almost everything that ails our healthcare system. Um, so the story goes is that burnout is making good people leave, and as a result, healthcare, both as a workplace but also as a place to receive care, is suffering. It's a headache for administrators um, trying to staff their departments and their organizations, and it's a disaster for patients seeking care, right? right? Um, because improperly staffed floors leave workers in a position where they feel they're asked to provide sort of substandard care, creating the conditions for what some have called moral injury, um, the condition when people are asked to go against their individual or professional ethics regarding care because of the particular constraints of the workplace. So this story of burnout is a compelling one um, because there's much of it that rings true for both workers and patients alike. But I think that there are other stories to tell that perhaps the sort of singular for focus on burnout has elided or obscured. Because while I think it remains important to think about how and why folks are choosing to leave, I think it's equally important that we begin really thinking through what might be happening um, for those who decide to stay, as well as for those who are newly entering healthcare. Um, and I think that this question of, about stayers and enterers is particularly important when you're thinking about the nursing workforce. Because early in the pandemic, we certainly did see registered nurses leave the field. Um, we know that many nurses who were close to retirement age left the nursing workforce um, during the pandemic years, the height of the pandemic years of 2020 and 2021. However, that trend seems to have been a momentary one, right? Really fueled by early retirement. So um, working age nurses seem to have stayed. Um, the data that we have so far um, seem to suggest that if nurses didn't have the financial means to retire, they largely stayed put. Um, so despite um, surveys, which I'm sure you've all seen, that are always announcing um, nurses' intent to leave the workforce, we don't really yet have any robust empirical evidence that this intent has turned into behavior. There has not been a mass exodus of nurses from healthcare, despite epidemic, persistent, and enduring levels of burnout. So the story of burnout pushing nurses out of the profession doesn't really seem to match the sort of macro level demographic evidence. But this stability at the macro level doesn't quite match the experience of folks on the ground, right? When you talk to administrators or um, anyone who works on the floor, they are univocal in their observation of high levels of instability, 
Um, understaffing seems to have gotten worse. People seem to come and go more quickly than they once did. Um, so it, it's not entirely clear what explains the sort of contradiction between the macro and the micro. But what is clear is that the nurses who have remained um, and those who are newly entering are exhibiting different labor market behavior than they once did. And so for me, this has raised an important set of questions because this contradiction seems to indicate that what has changed in the post-pandemic nursing workforce is less about a commitment to the profession, but a changed understanding of what that commitment means. Um, and so being the you know, observer of, of, of organizational social life that I am, I really began to think about the ways in which um, these changes and how RNs are navigating their workplace and professional institutions may also have impacts on nursing practice um, and how they understand what it means to be a good nurse. And I have good reasons for, for raising this question and making that particular connection because we know that the practice orientations of nurses is not just shaped by professional maxims or norms learned in nursing school, but by their institutional position within the healthcare workplace. So nursing is a demographically female and socially gendered profession, making it the iconic care work profession in the healthcare workforce. So thinking about what care work is, there's lots of different typologies and lots of different definitions, but the most straightforward one, in my view, is empirical, which is that care work overlaps with labor historically performed by women in the domestic sphere. So that those who perform this kind of work, whether paid or unpaid, continue to have that work marked by gender, as well as the lower status associated with doing women's work. And who we see performing that work bears some relation to how that work unfolds. So care work is generally understood as being inherently relational meaning that it's based less on discrete services than on a general responsiveness to the needs of the person being cared for. So for example, one of the ways in which nursing has traditionally defined what nursing work is, is to say that nursing work is doing that which people would do for themselves if they could. Right? And so knowing what one's patient would do requires knowing the patient. So in this way, relationship is really at the bedrock of what it means to provide nursing care, you know, not in terms of affect, but as an embodied source of expertise, because one can only care for the patient by knowing their needs, so that the skill of the nurse is measured in part by their attentiveness to the possibilities of knowing the patient through the fostering of relationship. So relationships, of course, are not one-sided. Um, for it to work, there must be trust. Right? And trust is not something that exists between, is not something that just exists between individuals, but it also exists between social roles. Right? And the trust that the public, the population of possible patients, has in nurses runs quite deep. Year after year, public opinion polls report that the public considers nurses to be the most trusted profession. So what grounds that trust is complex and multi-layered. Um, but I think it's important to sort of underline one piece of that, um, which is that for most of its history, nursing has waged a very successful campaign to be seen as an icon of middle class white womanhood. Right? So this race and gendered image of the profession had not only helped in crafting um, this sort of relationship with the public and gaining the public's trust, it has also made nursing one of the singular care work occupations that carries a middle class income. But it's not just the relationship that nurses have with patients that matters. It's also the one that they have with their employing organization. Um, because nursing has always had a rather complicated but symbiotic relationship with their employer that really distinguishes it from other healthcare occupations, right? So when we think of physicians, for example, the sort of prototypical profession um, in healthcare, they are traditionally thought of as being consultants. And although that has really changed symbolically, as any patient knows who's ever gotten a bill directly from um, a provider, um, a, a physician, right? Their client is the patient rather than the hospital. Right? They're working for the patient, not their employing organization. But nurses historically have always been employees and have always had to consider the patient to also be their client. 
right? So nurses, in fact, don't work for patients. They work for employing organizations and it's employing organizations who they have to satisfy to remain employed, not their patients, right? So it's the hospital's insatiable need historically for skilled labor that has made um, the hospital both the chief exploiter of, of the nursing workforce, but also in many ways, the founder of their professional feast, right? Uh, so the contours of this relationship are theorized to matter, um, not just for how nurses think about who they are, but in terms of how they conceptualize and carry out what it is that they do. So nursing scholar Davina Allen um, um, talks a lot about the way that nurses provide organizational labor in the hospital setting. She writes, quote, it is nurses who reconcile the requirements of healthcare organizations with those of patients. It is nurses who broker, interpret, translate, and communicate clinical, social, and organizational information in ways that are consequential for patient diagnoses and outcomes. In fulfilling these roles, it is nurses who weave together the many facets of the service and create order in a fast flowing and turbulent work environment." End quote. So for Alan, nurses' organizational labor is predicated on the relationships that they're able to forge within organizations, right? So this weaving together that she describes that nurses do at the bedside really requires a kind of expanse of knowledge of and relationships with clinical, other clinical, administrative, and support staff. So in my own work on nurse practitioners, my book, More Than Medicine, you know, um, I, um, Kay, sort of from that work emanated a, a slightly different but related concept, which is an idea of, of organizational care work. Um, um, because I found that it's not just that the nurses that I observed reconciled patient and organizational concerns, as Alan noted, Rather, that they are really called to be responsive and to care about the needs of their employers in the work of care and for their patients. So, for example, the NPs that I followed um, who were working in an ambulatory community based long term care organization that provided comprehensive care right through providing a range of wraparound services. But this mission of the organization of providing comprehensive care really required the nurse practitioners to routinely put out organizational fires and to smooth over the inefficiencies of their organizational workplace, right? Um, and the organization um, implicitly as well as explicitly um, valued MPs more who were able to put out those fires regardless of their ability to provide what we think of as being good clinical or competent medical care. Um, so this putting out of organizational fires was certainly beneficial for the patients, but it also was beneficial for the organization. So in both of these conceptual views of nursing labor, organizationally embedded relationships matter for the doing of nursing work. For Alan, it's relationships forged within the organization that, are, that matter. And for me, it's relationships and responsibilities forged to the organization itself that matters for nursing work. So it's this understanding of nursing practice that really raised questions for me um, in terms of thinking about how changed employment behavior of nurses might pretend changed orientations in nursing practice, and in particular, thinking about what it might mean um, for shifting understandings of what it means to be a good nurse. So you know, one of the things that I really wanted to, you know, sort of ground the talk in is really then thinking about what happens when these relationships to both patients and employers are strained. Um, because you don't have to do a study to know that one of the things that the pandemic did was to strain these relationships, right? Um, we have this sort of specter of strained relationship with patients, right? Um, so, you know, everyone either experienced or heard um, about um, the kinds of organizational mandates that were coming out of the pandemic, um, having to do with the enforcing of masking policies, the enforcement of visitation policies. Um, and it was really nurses who became the kind of organizational muscle to carry out those kinds of mandates, which also means that they became the bedside punching bags um, for patients um, who disagreed with these kinds of policies. Um, it is also true that during this time when there was a lot of um, lay disagreement about treatment, um, 
Nurses also became, again, the bedside punching bags for patients who um, distrusted um, the medical interventions prescribed by um, the attending physician. But the, the attending physician wasn't there, <laughs> right? It's the nurses who were there at the bedside um, taking the kinds of um, disagreements and abuse from patients, right? So I don't know if nurses will remain the most trusted profession um, in sort of subsequent um, surveys because that's a relative measure, but I don't need a survey to hypothesize that absolute levels of trust in nursing are probably have decreased over time. There's also the specter of trained relationships with employers. Um, again, you know, one look at the news um, and, you know, all you can really see um, is evidence of the many strikes that have occurred in healthcare organizations. So nurses may not be front and center in most of these labor disputes, but nursing's participation in any kind of organized labor action is actually an historical flashpoint. Nursing as a profession has been fairly conservative when it comes to labor action. So seeing them being involved in these sort of new ways of um, organizing against employing organizations really speaks to changing understandings of the degree of loyalty that nurses believe that they owe their employer. So while these strains have likely increased for everyone doing patient-facing work, nurses' reliance on the strength of patient and organizational relationships as the bedrock skill of nursing practice really raises important questions for how the pandemic may not only have changed working conditions, but in how it has changed professional orientations to the work itself. So, you know, in the last few years, I've really um, focused um, my attention on the pandemic experience of nurses to understand how working during the pandemic may have been the provenance of different or changed understandings and what it means to both forge a nursing career um, while being a, quote, good provider. So, just to sort of give you a sort of a preview um, of, of the kinds of things that I'm sort of finding um, in this analysis, um, you know, one of them is that in talking to registered nurses who worked during the pandemic, I found that despite reports of the horrors of working during the pandemic, they've largely sort of normalized, right, this, these traumatic experiences, which is to say the rising dissatisfaction and burnout that may be underneath stated intentions to leave the profession are not about the sort of um, increased stressful working conditions that they experienced while working during the pandemic. Rather, um, they spoke to me very sort of compellingly and intimately um, about um, the severed trust um, that they are experiencing between themselves and their patients, and even more strongly, the feeling of having been abandoned by their employer. Um, so what felt uniquely hard for the RNs that I spoke with was not the increased risk that they faced and are continuing to face, but rather the feeling that they are left to face these risks alone. And while the stories that people tell can never establish a cause and effect relationship, they can tell you something about the changed frames of understanding of how people understand what it means to go about doing their job. So, um, just going to talk briefly about the methods. If if this is of interest um, to folks, I'm happy to answer more questions about this um, during the Q and A. Um, but um, these results um, came out of um, 75. Um, interviews um, that me and, and my research team completed um, in 2021, um, as well as um, 16 um, um, interviews um, done more recently um, in the past year um, with travel nurses. Um, and um, just a word in terms of thinking about um, these interviews, um, um, which is that in some ways they were they were they were ethnographic interviews, and and sort of what I mean by that is that um, I I had a um, um, a guide um, for the questions, but really I took more of an oral history approach in terms of trying to capture what were the salient experiences that people had um, um, during the pandemic, which is another way of saying. Um, I did not probe necessarily for the kinds of responses that I received. I got the kinds of things that registered nurses um, felt were salient to share about their experiences um, working during the pandemic. 
And then just a word about limitations. Um, although my eligibility criteria um, did not exclude RNs who had left the nursing workforce, um, it was the case that all of the RNs who were interested in being interviewed had remained in the nursing workforce um, 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 at the time of the interview. Um, so, first, you know, um, I started out by saying that one of the things um, that um, that came out of these interviews was really thinking about the ways in which um, um, nurses um, sort of normalized the kinds of traumatic experience that they had ex um, experienced during the pandemic. So I really just wanted to spend a couple of minutes sort of summarizing, you know, where that evidence came from. You know, so in terms of thinking about, you know, how nurses describe what working during the pandemic was like, in a word, it was hell, right? Um, the nurses I spoke to shared um, their fair sh share stories um, um, about, you know, working for the first few months with no PPE, um, of the um, rampant uncertainty about um, how it was transmitted, um, of thinking about, um, um, for many of them, the sort of first experience that they had had with so much death um, of grief that they were not able to express because they had to keep coming to work day after day. Um, they talked about the sort of stress of being called into work on their days off, being pulled into working into the ICU without any previous ICU experience, right? But even in 2021, these stories had already began to lose their emotional tenor. Um, and in terms of how they told their stories, right, um, they had already began to really normalize um, their most traumatic experience. Because nursing, they told me, it's always hard work. The pandemic may have been especially hard, but the hardships um, that were intensified were known and expected hardships. Right? Um, so they would say, yeah, we really struggled with staffing, but you know, we were, we're always short staffed, they'd say with an oral shrug. Um, or many of them sort of told stories, um, either of their own experiences or sort of shared professional experiences of other times they or the nursing profession at large had faced a similar kind of stress. Um, so many of them told stories about um, what it was like to work as a nurse um, during the 1980s um, AIDS crisis or about the experience of working during localized outbreaks of Ebola. And again, it didn't matter whether they had experienced those things or not. They felt as if the profession had experienced those things. Um, and so therefore, again, the pandemic became just yet another one of those things that had stressed um, them in ways that may have been unique in its tenor, but in terms of what the stress actually was, looks like the normal doing of nursing work. Um, so whether from personal or borrowed experiences, right, they really sort of normalize their experiences, um, um, uh, these sort of horror stories, um, as I noted before, um, of working during the pandemic. Um, they really felt that what it was to be a nurse um, was to get up in the morning and go do your job, face the risks that were there, um, and to make it work. And that's simply what it is that nurses do. But what they could not normalize was their experience of really um, sort of attenuated relationships with patients and the seeping in um, of distrust. From the very beginning of the pandemic, the nurses um, um, that I talked to um, talked about the sort of um, embodied um, um, rise of physical distance um, between um, themselves and their patients, right? Um, so one nurse, um, and some of that was, was simply because of the, of the shift in pandemic conditions. So one nurse who worked directly with COVID-19 patients described the distance she felt in something as basic as communication. She noted the HEPA filters were like so loud, they're definitely loud. Well, on our COVID units, and I mean, that's just what it was. So I was always, you know, like screaming at my patients, you know, through my N95 and then my shield, trying to get them to hear me. So this sort of forced separation um, was a central aspect of infection control, um, um, both in terms of thinking about this sort of you know, auditory um, kind of um, separation, but also thinking about the ways in which infection control procedures bar direct patient, direct contact with patients unless deemed medically necessary. And so for nurses who really enjoyed working at the bedside, this was really experience of a significant loss and really stripped away one of the core features of what they found appealing about bedside nursing. This physical separation, however, seemed to portend a more 
ominous appearance of the gulf of distrust that nurses began to feel emanating from their actual patients, as well as the prospective patients in the form of the public. So this growing distrust appeared in ways that were both small, um, but also quite large. So, one of the nurses described um, this, the experience of having to secure masks. Um, and I don't share these, this kind of story, right? Because it was common or even necessarily an accurate reflection um, of any particular situation, but really because of the ways in which um, folks make sense, right? Um, the story that they tell of this sort of changed um, situation. Um, so, one nurse recounted, we were having to watch our masks because people were taking our entire bins of masks from our floor. So, we used to have like contact carts out in the hall and we'd hide or lock away all the masks. Visitors were taking them, yes, off our contact carts in the hall. So, we were hiding all of those. So, these sort of small acts of distrust were underscored by larger ones. Nurses shared stories of patients arguing with them about mask policies, shouting at them about visitation policies, and started he starting heated arguments about whether COVID-19 was a real disease. One nurse noted, I think that has been one of the worst things, is like having to listen to people say that it's not real and that it's a hoax and that we're like sheep and everything like that when they don't know what it's like to be on the front line. They not only faced this sort of specter uh, of distrust from their patients, but also from their relatives and close friends, the population of prospective patients. One nurse reported, I was part of so many WhatsApp group chats that I'm not part of anymore. With people posting conspiracy theories about how this is not real, it makes you so angry. So the most trusted profession experienced a growing distrust from the public that was in some ways um, unexpected. Um, so one of the things um, that did not come up in my interviews in 2021, but has become a consistent theme in both the interviews from the travel nurses interviewed in 2023, as well as stories shared by nurses and lay publications, which is that the rise of misinformation has really eroded the public's trust in medical experts in general. And when patients want a person to unload their conspiracy theories onto, that person who was seen as both an expert, but who was also available to them is the nurse at the bedside. So I really wanted to spend um, sort of the, the bulk um, of my time talking about um, the growing strained relationships that nurses experience with their employing organizations. Because I think that, that for me, this is one of the most salient and important themes coming out of the um, stories um, that I collected. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, nursing's relationship with their employers is a complicated one. Um, and one of the features that makes it so complicated is nursing's perennial sense of devaluation by their employer. Um, nurses have long worked in the shadow of the physician. And at the professional level, they have struggled to be seen as having a valued perspective distinct from those of their physician colleagues. So it's not uncommon for the lay public and some physicians to believe that nursing practice consists of little more than following orders. This de-skilled view of nursing practice is not, is not just part of popular discourse, but for many nurses, they see it in the material embodiment um, in the wages that they receive. So while average RN salaries represent a solid middle class income for a profession that only requires a bachelor's degree, nurses have long complained that their wages, while initially high, remain stagnant throughout their careers. Signing bonuses and high salaries may be used to lure nurses to a particular hospital or unit, but hospitals offer RNs few rewards for either loyalty or the expertise that comes with time. So this complaint preceded the pandemic. However, the pandemic brought out in sharp relief um, sort of systematic provenance of these complaints, right? So for the, um, for the nurses that I talked to, there are ways in which the pandemic became the kind of aberrant case through which they were able to question the relationship that they actually had with their employers. So when it came to stagnant wages, many nurses developed a new sense um, or a new analysis of their systematic devaluation from this experience. Um, again, stagnant wages is sort of um, 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 
is a situation about which every nurse grumbles um, that most um, generally accept. Um, many had developed sort of localized explanations, right, of their pay differential, right? It's because they work at a public hospital, it's because of the high level of Medicaid patients, because they work at a rural hospital, or because their particular hospital is struggling financially. However, as they watched hospitals find money to pay traveling nurses what seemed like exorbitant salaries, they began to develop a national understanding um, of um, their low wages. As one nurse noted, um, the travel nurses easily make double what I make for doing the same job. So yeah, doing their job, doing their job at the same pay I was making before is real cool. Um, and while some popular news pieces have suggested that staff nurses are resentful of travel nurses' higher wages, the nurses that I spoke with seem to support travel nurses. One nurse who worked in New York State during the height of the pandemic noted, thank God for the travelers. I don't know how long we would have lasted without the travel nurses that had shown up to like almost save us because we were working so many hours. We were just so exhausted. So while being understanding of travel nurses, they were less understanding of a system that seemed to rely on them. One nurse noted, one of the things that you see hospitals doing is, you know, kind of quick fixes for the staffing, staffing shortages, which actually ends up driving up the cost of healthcare and of staffing all across the board. Another nurse more pointedly asked, if they can find the money to pay a traveling nurse, why can't they pay us more? And in regards to being valued less than, um, other providers alongside they, alongside they, <laughs> whom they worked alongside, um, many nurses expressed the experience of being asked to take unique risks as nurses. Um, more than a few nurses that I talked to noted that in the early months of the pandemic, many hospitals experienced a shortage of, of PPE. Um, and nurses were by and large sympathetic to the plight of their individual employers. Um, a scarcity of PPE was a national problem. They assumed that their administrators were doing the best they could under a difficult set of circumstances. But they were less sympathetic to what many say was a decision to protect other workers rather than nurses, even though they were the providers being asked to bear the brunt of exposure to patients. Almost all the nurses um, recounted um, having to deal with mass shortages and being asked to reuse or sanitize N95 masks over um, several days. But there were more, there were two or three nurses who described provider level differences and who received masks. One nurse who worked at a general medical surgical unit of a large hospital noted, we were told to reuse our masks. Many of us found ways of purchasing our own, but the physicians on the ward, they seem to have no problem securing masks. So I include this experience, not necessarily because it's emblematic of nursing experiences, um, but because of the sense that these nurses made of it. Right? Um, it was just one of many examples in, when, in which nurses told stories of being called to take unique, unique risks by their employing organization in ways that made them feel uniquely devalued. Another example um, of stories of unique risk was in regards to who was asked to bear the highest risk of infection in the hospital setting. So infection control procedures not only barred families and friends from the rooms of COVID patients, it also barred most members of the care team from direct contact unless deemed medically necessary. This included CNAs and chaplains, but it also included attending physicians, physicians assistants and nurse practitioners. So the RNs who worked directly with COVID-19 patients noted that it was common protocol for the attending to rely on the nurse's physical assessment and notes in order to make treatment decisions. In many cases, the nurse was the only one who entered the treatment room. This meant that the bedside nurse ended up doing additional work and taking additional risks. One nurse who was not an ICU nurse, but who had been asked to work in the unit due to worker shortages, described a situation in which I literally had the ICU director one morning tell us we had to stop doing our work and start mopping floors. I mean the nurses. So for the first six months of the pandemic, nurses basically did everything. We transported our own patients, we cleaned our own rooms, we trashed out our own rooms, we changed linens and removed trash, we ran everything. Um, the same nurse recounted how this impacted clinical care. She noted, I mean, literally, the only people going in rooms for a while were the respiratory therapists and then us. Another nurse recounted not only the feeling of being alone at the bedside, but of also feeling invisible and abandoned. Um, she noted, I remembered reading 
um, um, the NPs and like the attendance notes about how they cared for the patient and like examined the patient. And I'm like, your entire examination is based on what I told you because you never went in that room. I remember like at one point a patient was crashing on me and I wasn't even an ICU nurse and I'm literally a fish in a fishbowl. Everybody's outside making decisions and just yelling at me through a walkie talkie, telling me what to do or like talking to me about the patient status through a walkie talkie, um, telling me the plan through a walkie talkie. Meanwhile, I'm the only one at the bedside. So, again, I want to be clear about what is being con conveyed. Um, these kinds of complaints are not about the work itself. The work itself being hard or being difficult or being challenging. It was the feeling of being left to fend for themselves while doing that work. So, at the time of the pandemic, um, so I had another experience of a nurse um, who um, was, was um, recounting to me what it felt like to feel like they were bearing the brunt of these risks alone. Um, um, and she was talking about the ways in which when the pandemic hit, um, she was asked to practice in a way that she felt was singularly unsafe, both for her license, but also for her patients. Um, she noted, you know, at the time that the pandemic hit, I had only been, been a nurse for like coming up on one year, but like not a very long time. Um, and I had done all of that work on the same unit. Um, I'd only floated a handful of times um, because I hadn't been eligible to float as a new nurse. Um, they usually don't let you float for a little while until you get comfortable in the unit. Um, and then all of a sudden my unit is closed and I'm floating every single shift. Um, and there really was this feeling that they were being put um, um, in unsafe conditions and being asked to sort of bear the brunt of these risks on their own. So I'm really close to time. And so I wanna make sure that we have time for some questions. So um, I'm just gonna spend my last few moments sort of sketching out what I'm thinking about in terms of how these change relationships um, are impacting nursing orientations to practice. Um, first to how they navigate their careers, but also in terms of what it means to be a good or skilled nurse. So many of the nurses um, that um, I, I spoke with talked about trying to figure out ways not of leaving but of thinking about ways of staying um, and part of the way in which um, they recounted um, trying to stay was through um, using particular strategies of disengagement um, so um, so many of the nurses that i interviewed reported changing jobs during the pandemic um, um, or were actively planning to change jobs, again, not leaving the workforce, but to change the, um, um, the nursing job that they had. Um, um, many of them were actively planning to attend graduate school in order to change jobs in the future. Um, um, and for many, you know, they were really talking about the ability to move to locations of practice with less patient interaction. Um, um, and, um, I also then want to talk a little bit about the things that I was hearing um, from the travel nurses um, that I interviewed, um, um, which I think sort of provided a particular kind of purchase on this idea of strategies of disengagement. Um, um, the travel nurses that I that I spoke with um, were not largely attracted to travel nursing um, um, simply because of the money. Right? They were attracted to tra travel nursing as a way um, um, of being able to do the work with a different kind of orientation. Um, they talk about not having to deal with the politics of the floor. They talk about um, 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 having their contract actually provide them with job protection so they can't be asked to come in at all hours um, 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 all the time that there are actually protections um, in, embedded and enshrined in their contract. Um, and they really talk about um, their need to just come to work, right? And so when they talk about um, you know, what it means then for them to sort of do this kind of work um, under conditions um, of short-term contracts, um, they say, you know, um, it is a little bit more difficult. You know, you arrive at a place and you don't necessarily know how they do things, but you wanna know what? I'm a skilled nurse. I just wanna come to work and do my job and go home. Um, and I want to then just think about what some of these implications might be um, for the way in which nursing practice might shift, right? One of them is really thinking about the ways in which this idea of, I just want to come to work, um, do my job and go home, um, is really sort of thinking about um, the ways in which 
Um, there's a potential for the decentering of the importance of relationship um, with patients. Um, thinking about um, the ways in which um, burnout doesn't just happen um, in terms of thinking about the ways in which it pushes people wholesale out, um, but thinking about the ways in which it impacts and shifts um, their understanding um, of their need to um, be responsive to all of the needs of the patients um, um, under their care. Um, and also really thinking about the sort of attenuation of organizational knowledge. Um, um, when one is doing um, moving um, either through travel nursing, um, short-term contract nursing, or through simply high rates of turnover, going from job to job to job, that kind of movement attenuates the kind of organizational knowledge that nurses have. Um, and without this kind of organizational knowledge, how are these nurses going to do the reconciliation that Alan talks about, or the organizational care work that I observed in my own work? Um, third, um, I think this really sort of speaks to um, the ways in which um, this idea of moral injury is perhaps not capturing exactly what's going on, but really more a moral recalibration. Moral injury really asks us to imagine that people enter into their profession with a static set of values that then the workplace asks them um, um, to um, contradict, right, in ways that they find to be sort of um, um, existentially stressful. Um, but partly what we may be seeing in this structural shift in how nursing work unfolds um, is a recalibration, right, of the the kind of activity um, 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 that is considered to be good nursing work um, and good ethical decision making. Um, and finally, I think um, with these sort of shifts that are happening and the ways in which nurses um, are experiencing and thinking about um, what it means to be a good nurse, you have changing ideas um, of nursing responsibility. Who's responsible for smoothing over the inefficiencies of the organization? Um, it's probably going to be less likely that new cohorts of nursing, um, if these narratives right, continue um, to be um, the sort of abiding experience of nurses on the floor, um, it is um, less likely that we will see the same levels of um, feelings of responsibility for the organization that we've seen in previous cohorts. So I just want to end um, by really thinking about um, the ways in which these sort of shifts in um, nursing practice um, and nursing orientations is really a bellwether for other kinds of providers. Um, nursing generations replace quickly. I was having a conversation with my colleague um, um, in my department um, and I, who studies um, 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 the physician workforce. And I was saying, you know, in long-term care, most nurses have an associate's degree, it's two years. Um, in the hospital setting, it's four years. We're four years into the pandemic, <laughs> right? Um, those first, like 2020 was sort of the first year. We are now seeing nurses um, um, who have only worked during the pandemic. And students are being trained by these nurses who have only worked during the pandemic. I actually think that we are already experiencing a generational shift um, in nursing orientations that we haven't yet quite been able to have empirical purchase on because that generational cycle has happened so quickly. Um, the second is the ways in which nursing practice impacts everyone's practice, right? Partly in terms of thinking about the ways in which um, the organizational label, labor and the organizational care work um, that nurses perform, but also in terms of thinking about um, the ways in which nurses act as a sort of linchpin of information flows, right? Um, thinking about the ways in which, for example, um, um, other members of the care team really um, um, rely on the observations of the nurse at the bedside um, um, as a as in terms of providing information that they then use to make the kinds of clinical and ethical decisions that they make. Um, and I think that there are really important questions of thinking about the ways um, in which um, um, these sort of shifts and how nurses sort of view what it means to forge a nursing career and to do nursing work will impact not only the way that nurses do their work, but also the ways in which everyone else does their work as well. So I just want to end by providing some acknowledgments um, um, of the support that I received, um, both scholarly um, and financial, um, um, for the 16 travel nurse interviews from the UW Center for the Health Workforce Studies um, with the PI of Bianca Frogner. Um, so with that, um, I did leave some time for questions, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Latan. 
Thank you, uh, LaTanya. Dr. Trotter, that was a really powerful um, conversation and, and talk. Um, I think it's, um, although I go to hear a lot of sociologists speak and read a good bit of sociology, I still think there's something always disorienting about uh, a so sociological analysis that sort of describes um, like perhaps why I might think what about the things I think about and like uh, in a sense sort of explain my thoughts. So it's, I'm really interested in um, hearing kind of how that uh, experience might have been for some of the nurses on uh, this um, this talk as well. And we have some good conversations going on in the chat. Um, I'll ask just a question. Do you think, um, to kick us off, do you think, um, or could you say a bit more about this sense of, or do you think that there is an ongoing um, sort of erosion of um, commitment to um, something that's going on and can sort of be manifesting in the increased number of strikes. You said that historically nursing was not um, particularly active in kind of labor relations. You know, I'm, we're seeing physicians for the first time, I think, ever this year um, yes. begin to unionize. So I'm just wondering if the nursing experience in what ways it's unique and kind of how do you think like the sense of commitment or self-understanding has changed and why? Um, so I think that you're right. I think that we're seeing um, wholesale shifts um, in the ways in which healthcare workers are thinking about their relationship to the workforce. Um, I do think that, you know, partly what is different about um, the nursing experience is really thinking about their their distinctive relationship with their employer, right? So when you think, for example, about why it is that physicians don't have, don't generally strike, it's really because they had no one to strike against, right? I mean, they again the archetypal physician, the archetypal way in which physician labor is structured is that they are consultants. Their only client is the patient. Now, of course, to some extent, that has always been um, um, as much symbolic as real. But it also had some reality, you know, underneath it right, as well um, um, in terms of thinking about um, who they're responsible for. So physicians wouldn't have struck because um, um, who would they be striking against um, as sort of, you know, symbolically self-employed folks, but also because they're professionals. Strikes are what workers do and physicians are not workers, they're professionals, right? But in some ways, when you think about the, the conservatism around nursing, um, it really has been about um, a couple of things, um, actually many things, but the, I think the things that are important um, to sort of point out or interesting to point out now are really thinking about um, their loyalty to their employer is the way in which they demonstrate care for patients. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I mentioned before loyalty to, to employers and I, even as I heard myself saying it, I thought, well, that's only half the story. That loyalty, that taking care of organizational concerns is the way in which nurses care for patients. Right. The sort of idea that we will not abandon our patients um, um, by striking. Um, we will meet the needs of the organization so that the organization can meet the needs of the patients. That's how we pro provide care through this kind of care for organizational concerns that workers are not supposed to care <laughs> about their organ about their employers concerns but for most of nursing's history that really it's very very difficult to extricate um, its commitment to care for patients with its practical commitment to care for the needs um, of their employer and so um, you know I think that for me part of this idea of what is lost um, or what is being lost really is um, really an attenuation, right, of that long-standing idea that to care for patients is to care for the needs of the organization, right? And I think that that's partly why you are beginning to have things like travel nursing. Um, um, there's a... <laughs> That's a whole nother discussion in, in, in many ways, right? Because in some ways it, it was a blip, right? They paid a lot of money, people didn't travel nursing, the money's dried up, people aren't doing travel nursing, <laughs> you know, um, you know in, in the same way. However, the desire for that kind of 
flexible relationship with their employer, there is still a demand for that in the nursing workforce and employers are beginning to meet that demand. And I don't think that that demand was there in the same way before because so much of um, you know, nursing expertise is about this sort of organizational embeddedness, right? I mean, again, there's always been this sort of tension between is nursing, is nursing's value about the technical expertise or is it about something else? But I, I do think, um, you know, that debate notwithstanding, there are ways in which that kind of organizational embeddedness has always been a part of what it means to have nursing skill. Um, and I think without that, um, it's really just going to have a fundamental a fundamentally different sort of shift in how nurses go about thinking about what it means to be a good nurse. Mm. Um, um, Judith Baggs asked, um, what can employers do to support nursing to demonstrate concern for their nurses? Any chance they can regain trust of the nurses? It'd be interesting to hear your kind of how trust come, can come back. Ah. <sighs> I mean, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to answer that question, right? Um, um, because in some ways, you know, that trust with their employer was not always simply because the employer had earned it, <laughs> right? Um, it really, in some ways, was about the ways in which the pandemic kind of made little sociologists of all nurses. They came away with a structural understanding of their position that perhaps they didn't have before. Um, um, and so, you know, in some ways, you know, there are ways that I think that trust actually has been lost in ways that I don't think can be regained in quite the same way. Um, I actually think that what may end up becoming different, right, is thinking about, um, changed understandings of the ways in which nurses relate um, to employers, thinking about the push towards unionization, right? Thinking about the ways in which nurses will begin to um, negotiate in different kinds of way with employer organizations. So wielding their power in very different kinds of ways. I think that we're just, I think that there isn't really any going back um, in part because I, I think that, you know, looking at the Forces that are shaping and reshaping healthcare are really moving more towards um, more of the same. Um, I think, you know, in speaking with the travel nurses, one of the things that was really interesting to me was they were like, yeah, the travel nursing jobs have really just dried up, but the rise of short term contracts without the pass through of the, of the, of the agencies is on the rise. Hospitals are coming up with internal travel programs are coming up with apps. <laughs> um, I, app, you know, I use word gig based as not as not a, um, a euphemism for travel nursing. Literally, there is the rise of gig based nursing where you can use an app to secure nursing labor um, um, on, on very short term contracts, i.e. by the day or the week. Um, and we're really, I think we're seeing a, a ratcheting up. Um, of this sort of attenuation of the relationship between nurses and employers um, and in, in ways that I don't think can be regained. And it's just going to be different. Um, mm. um, I think we probably have time for this last question. Um, um, Sally Bowman asked, are there other industries, quote unquote, uh, particularly in human services that are that have been on this same path before or behind healthcare? where there's this tension between organizational and client responsibilities so that we can sort of look to these other prof institutions or professions and predict the future for nursing? Not that I know of. Um, in some ways, I mean, I, you know, not that I can think of at the moment and, and, and I'll, you know, which may or may not be true. I might just have to keep thinking about the answer to that question. But I think one of the reasons why I began studying the nursing workforce is because of its singularity. It is just really um, a unique um, profession, um, 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 unique both in the US context, but also sort of unique globally, like US nursing doesn't look like nursing anywhere else in the world um, um, because of a particular set of sort of historical um, and or this sort of historical symbiotic relationship um, between um, 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 organizations and the profession itself. Um, 
And so, you know, one of the things that's been really interesting too is the ways in which nursing has been able um, to, to keep and elevate the status of their profession over time in ways that are completely not predicted by any other pre-existing cases. So when you start thinking about other kinds of cases like social work, um, they were never really able um, um, to gain uh, a middle class um, income um, or status, right? Um, you know, um, so thinking about sort of you know comparative kinds of um, 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 industries um, or, or occupational professions, there is something unique about nursing. So in some ways, it, you know, I always think of the ways in which nursing actually can help us maybe think about you know. The road not traveled by other sort of um, professions, um, um, as opposed to the other way around. Because for me, nursing really is quite unique. Mm. All right, we have time for one more question. Siko, I see you have your hand up. Feel free to unmute if you'd like to. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Doctor Roda. This is great. And my question is about the, uh, your comment about the moving toward to the more or less patient interaction. Mm. Just several slides back. Uh, the, I, I'm a nurse and I do a lot of interviews with nurses. And uh, you know, what I hear from them is that they are not uh they're prefer they are not tired from the taking care of the patient. Mm -hmm. But they seem to be more uh, uh they want to move into the, uh, the workplace where they can have a more direct patient care because that is the why they become a nurse hmm. but the, the you know current working situation is more like uh the you know moving the nurse away from the actual the, you know patient interaction and mm -hmm. they cannot see the end result of their work because patients you know then discharge from the hospital and they would never seen that the patient how they are surviving after discharge or whether they are kind of nurses are isolated from the actual patient interaction. So my feeling is that nurses really want to move into the more direct patient care and really working closely with them so they can see the result of their work. But I think the current work situation mm -hmm. is not built for that kind of the continuous engagement with the patient. So mm -hmm. nurses do not feel their work, the impact, the, uh, the changes they make on the patient's life. So uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, the nurses mm -hmm. want to move away from the patient induction rather than then go closer to the patient induction. I think that both are true because I think, I think one of the things that's really interesting is you know when nurses would talk about wanting to move away from the bedside. I mean, again, my my you know I started out my talk by saying the story that. Burnout is making people leave doesn't really seem to resonate right um, or that the stressful working conditions in and of themselves are the things that are making people leave, which I think matches what you're saying, mm -hmm. which is that nurses actually the hard work of being at the bedside was never the thing that was stressful. <laughs> right? So when they when they talk about um, wanting to leave the bedside. You know, what they're really um, narrating is their understanding that um, what it means to work at the bedside has changed <laughs> um, in ways that they find untenable, right? Um, so, um, you know, thinking about, you know, the ways in which, you know, part of what it used to mean, right, to be at the bedside was about, right, being able to feel like you had a, a kind of um, ability to have a relationship with patients. But I think that many of the nurses that I talk to are, are saying that, you know, many of the patients are not interested, right, in having this happen. Um, they talk about the ways in which um, the financialization of, of healthcare, um, the sort of increasing sort of profit motive has really just fundamentally changed, like what it means to be at the bedside. Um, and so they're not necessarily expressing a desire to stop having patient interaction. They're expressing a desire to have more control over how that interaction occurs. Um, and so, you know, even wanting to go and, for example, um, um, you know, um, some people, I mean, 
talked with one nurse who who was going back to school to become an MP, um, to be a psych MP. It wasn't necessarily because she had such a love for being a psych MP, but because she really just wanted to do telemedicine. Um, so she wanted patient interaction, but she wanted to have control right over that patient interaction. She no longer wanted to do it within the constraints of, of the hospital setting. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it will be interesting to think about the variety of ways in which nurses are trying to figure out how to stay because these are all stories of how nurses are trying to stay and so mm -hmm. i think that there is room for multiple ways in which nurses are trying to figure out how to stay um, um, but i but i you know I, I i think that you're right um it isn't that people are fleeing um, um, the kind of one-to-one -one clinical work, because for many of them, that's why they were in, in nursing to begin with, but they are making a set of adjustments um, for how to think about what it might mean to stay. I think that's a really powerful way to end too. And I am actually, is making me really rethink these, all the rhetoric around burnout, because I think when burnout is the problem, the solution is more wellness. But when um, the hamstringing of relational activity and care is the problem, then it's a different kind of solution. Um, and so I think that's something that we'll have to all keep really thinking about. It's very powerful. Thank you for that question, too. Um, all right, well, um, we're going to wrap up. And for those of you who are still on here, uh, power to you. Um, Dr. Trotter, that was a fantastic talk. I'm going to be thinking about it a lot um, and the ways it in, in impacts my own profession as well. So um, we'll have our, as Dave just posted, um, we'll have our um, talk and these slides posted next week. Um, our next talk will be on um, February 9th and we'll have Dr. Aaron Klein who will present um, on, uh, on dementia and the lens of relational agency. So probably be strumming some similar, um, to some similar tunes. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of your Friday and stay safe in the snow. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Trotter. Thank you.